call the meeting back to order. The next item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is public forum. The first public forum is a sign up. I don't see anybody, but if anybody would like to speak, I'm more than happy to recognize them at this point. Seeing none, I close the public forum portion and move on to examination of minutes. Can I get a motion on the minutes of April 23rd? Uh, Mr. President, I make a motion that we adopt the minutes of April 23rd as written. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Next item is President's report. Uh, I'll have enough to say a little later, so I'm not going to say anything under President's report. Next item on the agenda is presentations of petitions, proclamations, and similar papers and matters. It's an acceptance of a proclamation dedicating a memorial square to Private First Class Paul James Gorman. Mr. Manager. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, uh, members of the Town Council, uh, the audience here and audience at home. Uh, the administration's presentation on the on this matter will be I'll provide some opening remarks and then our veteran services officer Mr. Patrick George will come up and provide a little more background subsequent to Mr. George's uh, brief remarks he'll introduce uh, uh, the uh, sister of uh, private first class Paul James Gorman Barney to speak of her brother and then subsequent to that the presentation, Mr. Patrick George, the town's veteran services officer, will close, provide closing remarks on it. So by way of background, the correspondence, the issue before you is correspondence was forwarded from Patrick George, the town's veteran services officer, respectfully requesting a memorial square be dedicated to Warner Private First Class Paul James Gorman from U.S. Marine Corps who was killed in action on July 30th, 1968, while honorably serving our country in Vietnam. The Memorial Square would be located at the corner of Emerson and Main Streets. Uh, the correspondence that's been forwarded by Mr. George, Veteran Services Officer, is in accordance with the Town Council's Watertown Memorials and Dedication Policy that was adopted back in July of 2016. So, Mr. President, at this point, members of Council, I'd like to bring forward the town's veteran services officer, Mr. Patrick George. Patrick, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Manager, Mr. President, and the rest of the town council. Uh, this, uh, Mr. Gorman, was, it was brought to my attention back in the uh, middle of April that there was not a memorial square named after him. Uh, he was a Marine who was killed in action four days following his 20th birthday. And uh, I believe this is a situation that was simply overlooked. And I, I'm, I'm happy that, you know, and I'd like to thank everyone here that we're able to sort of remedy this as quickly as we have. Uh, it, uh, Jim Pendergrass, who was a member of the Shut Detachment, initially brought this to my attention. I'm glad he was here, and he is joined with Joe Darian, a fellow uh, Watertown High School graduate with Mr. Gorman, who they both uh, took the train down to uh, Paris Island when they went ready for boot camp. I'm fortunate enough that I got to fly down there and avoid an 11-hour <laughs> train ride when I went to Paris <laughs> Island myself. Uh, for way of background, I, you know, I would be remiss if I did not introduce Bonnie Gorman, who is going to do an infinitely better job describing who Paul Gorman was and the, wa you know, the, the water town that Paul Gorman knew. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Bonnie. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. This is a great honor. Um, here's a picture of Paul and myself. We were both uh, in uh, the military in the 60s, paying for our college education. Maybe I'll pass that around sliding around. Uh, at any rate, um, uh, we have uh, been a Gold Star family since Paul's death, um, and uh, he was killed, as you heard, uh, post Khe San in Vietnam, uh, as were uh, uh, hundreds of thousands uh, of um, others uh, during those wars. And uh, we, uh, as many Gold Star families, have been affected. Uh, my mother had a massive heart attack and eventually died uh, as a result of that war and, and the, the death of Paul. And, uh, and so many Gold Star families have experienced uh, the losses like that, physical and emotional losses as well. 
And uh, we are just coming off of uh, the fact uh, that um, my nephew, uh, who was a 20-year Marine veteran with multiple tours of duty uh, in the Middle East, has just committed suicide. So uh, we really have, uh, we have an obligation to our soldiers, uh, and from my perspective, is to bring peace and justice uh, to the soldiers and keep them home. Uh, but so I do work a lot on public policy issues. I myself am a nurse. I, I went over to a Vietnam AirVac network um, in uh, mid '60s and was over. Well, I was there totally for five years, so um, that paid for my schooling. Uh, Vietnam came along as a surprise after our sign up in '63. But um, we do have a wonderful opportunity to honor Paul and my family uh, that uh, we grew up on Emerson Road. That was his only uh, house that he ever lived in. And he and my parents are buried at Ridge Lawn, so it's very appropriate to be able to do that. But we thank you for the opportunity and the honor, and, and we'll have more opportunities to share detailed information about Paul. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to ask Vice President Bicciarelli to read the proclamation before we vote on it, please. Uh, <clears throat> Whereas Paul James Gorman was lovingly raised along with his four siblings, Jack, Eugene, Bob, and Bonnie, by John and Madeline Gorman, who made their home on Emerson Road in Watertown, Massachusetts. And whereas the Gorman children attended Watertown schools, were active in the community, and both Paul and Bonnie Gorman were called to service in defense of the United States of America during the Vietnam War. And whereas the youngest Gorman son, Paul, enlisted in the Marine Corps September 12, 1967, and proceeded to Paris Island, South Carolina, to begin training as a Marine Corps 0341 mortarman, Private First Class Gorman deployed overseas with Gulf Company, 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, 9th MAB, FM, FPAC, and on July 30th, 1968, was killed in action while assaulting an enemy position in support of casualty evacuation operations. Whereas on July 30th, 1968, the President of the United States of America, pursuant to authority vested in him by Congress, awarded the Purple Heart established by General George Washington at Newburgh, New York on August 7, 1782, posthumously to Private First Class Paul J. Gorman for military merit and for wounds received in action resulting in his death on July 30, 1968. And whereas Private First Class Gorman is buried in Ridgelawn Cemetery in Watertown, Massachusetts, alongside his loving parents, now, now, therefore, be resolved, excuse me, you know, Mr. President, sorry. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the town council of the city known as the town of Watertown hereby honors and recognizes Private First Class Paul James Gorman for his ultimate sacrifice for this country by naming the intersection of Main Street and Emerson Road in his honor, Private First Class Paul James Gorman Memorial Square. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get a motion on the proclamation? Uh, motion to accept. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> the ayes have it. Thank you very much. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. <clears throat> and looking forward to seeing the dedication uh, move forward. Um, I'd like to get a motion now to move up all of the items in, in section 10, please. So move. Is there second. a second? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. 10A is a resolution authorizing resolution approving the acceptance and expenditure of a gift of funds in the amount of $1,630 from the Costello family for the purpose of awarding scholarships to assist Watertown families with tuition costs of the popular youth summer camp, Camp Quasset facilitated by the Recreation Department. Mr. Manager. I thank you, uh, Mr. President, members of the Council. As uh, you just indicated, Mr. President, again, I too are very pleased 
to inform you the Costello family has offered to make a generous contribution in the amount of $1,630 for the purpose of awarding scholarships to assist Watertown families with tuition costs of the popular youth summer camp, Camp Aquasset. Uh, as indicated in the correspondence from the Costello family, the donation is being made to honor the memory of the late Philip Costello. Uh, at this point, Mr. President, the administration's presentation would be uh, Mr. Uh, Santola will speak and then we'll formally introduce a family member. But just prior to bringing Mr. Santola for, uh, forward for the folks here and at home, pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 44, Section 53A, any expenditure gift of funds need the approval of the town manager and the town council. So Mr. President, uh, members of the council, Mr. Peter Santola, the director of recreation. Thank you, Mr. Driscoll, town council members, town council president. Uh, Mr. Costello uh, was one of my mentors and just a wonderful man and a leader in the community. And I appreciate you taking the opportunity to allow us to bring forward uh, this donation. I uh, had the pleasure of receiving a call from Mr. Phil Costello, his son, and we talked about a potential donation. So thank you to the Costello family. And I'd like at this point to bring up Sean Costello to say a few nice words about his granddad. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Manager, and the rest of the town council. We appreciate you having us here this evening. We know you have a lot of business on your agenda, so I'll try not to be uh, too long-winded, um, but before uh, I, I launch into it, just a couple things I want to say about my grandfather. I have two things to say is that first of all, I know I speak on behalf of my family who are here when I say that it's an honor to have been here for that last vote and presentation. My grandfather was a United States Marine uh, who served overseas, so uh, it, it's an honor to be here for that presentation and for that vote. Um, and we also want to say that uh, we, uh, we know my grandfather would be incredibly proud of Mr. Santola and the work that he is doing with the uh, Watertown Recreation Department. I don't think I have to tell you folks how incredibly lucky you are to have a guy like Peter Santola running that department and doing such wonderful things with it. Uh, and, and we see our grandfather's legacy uh, continue through his good work. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Santola. Uh, I'm here with a few members of my family, just very quickly, my father, Phil Costello, uh, my uncle, Brian Costello, I think a lot of you probably know, um, <laughs> my aunt, Julie O'Neill, and my cousin, Jessica Costello. Uh, the three siblings all grew up in Watertown. Uh, Jessica and I did not, but Jessica works in Watertown. So uh, Watertown is, is uh, very prevalent in all of our lives still to this day. Uh, as I said, my grandfather, uh, Phil Costello, uh, was a United States Marine. He was uh, born and raised here in Watertown on Purvis Street. Um, and he was somebody who uh, you could tell just with any interaction that you had with him that Watertown was in his blood. Uh, he. Uh, did a whole lot of uh, different things throughout the town of Watertown uh, throughout pretty much his entire life. Uh, when he came back uh, from serving, he uh, decided to run for school committee. Uh, so he was a member of the school committee back then in, in his late 20s, which was pretty rare to see somebody at that young an age be elected to office back in the, the 40s and 50s. So he was in his late 20s when he was elected to the school committee and served two terms. Uh, which to me is something very special as I'm in my second term of my school committee in my town and it's something that uh, I try and carry forward in his memory. Um, but of course his greatest joy came from working directly with students. He was a teacher in Watertown Public Schools for 24 years. Uh, pretty often voted uh, the most popular teacher at his school. Uh, he was uh, a coach as well and he got to know so many kids throughout his coaching career. Uh, even if he didn't know how to play the sport, he'd coach it if they needed a coach. And he got to know so many kids through that. Uh, but the reason we're before you today is because we want to make a donation uh, to one of his strongest living <laughs> legacies, which is Camp Pequasset. Uh, he founded Camp Pequasset uh, and actually wrote and performed the theme song, which I, uh, Mr. Santola, correct me if I'm wrong, is still played at the camp to this day. Uh, music was a big part of his life as well. Uh, for nine years, uh, excuse me, seven years, he was the director of the Watertown Recreation Department. Uh, in that role, he expanded the department's offerings of year-round programs from about 40 to over 100. Uh, he also expanded youth basketball and began the state's first year-round athletic programming uh, for those with intellectual disabilities, uh, something that we're all very proud of. Um, of course, we're here because Camp Aquasset is something that he cared so deeply for, and we want to be able to see uh, young people in Watertown enjoy that for many years to come. We got together on Christmas and, and we decided instead of buying each other Christmas presents that we were going to make uh, donations and donate whatever we could 
uh, to Camp Pequasset and ensure that children uh, in Watertown can enjoy uh, all that has to offer. So um, I'd like to thank you for supporting those services at Camp Aquasset and supporting all of the services at the Recreation Department, all the work that you do. I know it's no easy task, but it, goes, uh, it does not go unnoticed. Uh, and I told my family that I'd close as we were sitting there. We looked at the town seal, and of course, the first thing that catches our eyes, it says Pequasset right on your town seal, right? <laughs> and that's, that's pretty obvious. But what uh, only my dad picked up on at first is that the year that Watertown was founded is there too, and that's the exact amount that the donation that we're giving is today. $1,630, uh, which is interesting, ironic, but I think that's uh, Mr. C pulling some strings upstairs. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to be with you today and, and speak on behalf of the greatest man I've ever known, greatest man I will ever know, a man that I hope to model myself after, my family hopes to model themselves after, uh, and a man whose legacy we hope will continue with this money for uh, many years to come for students who need it. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for your donation. Thank you very much, Sean. How about a nice hand? Well said. Get him on our school committee. Did a wonderful job. I respectfully request your fate. I'm sorry, Mr. Town Manager, Mr. Town President, uh, Town Council President. I respectfully request your favorable consideration in accepting this gift of funds for the purpose of Pequasa Scholarships for Families on behalf of the Mr. Phil of Costello's family and family. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get a motion to on the resolution approving the acceptance of the gift? Uh, Mr. President, I make a motion that we approve the acceptance and expenditure of gift of funds. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those, uh, Councilor Donato. I, I just wanted to, to thank the Costello family for this generous donation. I myself was a Camp Aquasa kid, and my brother Brian is the current director of Camp Aquasa. So uh, thank you very much for your generous donation. Uh, I know how much uh, the kids in town really value Camp Aquasset, and this is going to help a lot of kids spend a great summer. So thank you very much. Any other comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. <laughs> Next item is a resolution authorizing a transfer of $182,950 from the fiscal year 2019 debt retirement short-term interest account to the transfer to capital projects police mobile data account in order to move forward with the replacement of the mobile data system. Mr. Manager. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, uh, members of the council. The uh, administration's presentation tonight, I provided an opening of background information for the folks here and at home. Uh, subsequent to that, I respectfully ask Chief uh, Michael Lawn uh, will then speak on the need to replace the mobile data uh, system uh, soon in order to avoid any loss of crucial operating uh, f uh, functions. And then subsequent to Chief Lawn speaking, I will close with the, uh, the proposed uh, and speak to reviewing the funding for the proposed transfer of funds. So by way of background, back uh, on January 31 of this year, the proposed fiscal year 20 to 24 capital improvement program was submitted to town council. Subsequent to that, uh, on March 12th, the Honorable Town Council adopted 29 conceptual recommendations on the fiscal year 20 to 24 capital improvement program. One of the conceptual recommendation reads in part as follows, to proceed with the fiscal year 2019 proposed loan order of, uh, for $183,000 for the police department equipment consisting of a mobile data system replacement. So at this point, Mr. President, members of the council, I'd like to bring forward uh, uh, Chief uh, Michael P. Lawn to uh, speak uh, uh, just briefly on the correspondence, kind of updating what he had forwarded to us regarding the need to replace the mobile data system soon in order to avoid the loss of many crucial operating functions. So Mr. President, uh, Chief Lawn. Good evening, Mr. Manager, Mr. President, Town Council, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, so just briefly to explain this, this is the 17 computers in the cars that the officers use in the cars, and we have one laptop. And basically, we have a computer-aided dispatch system in the police station where the reports and everything's dispatched. And the issue is between these two talking to each other. Um, those systems in the cars, uh, over the years, we've used uh, for so much more. Um, they receive and transmit dispatch calls, um, communication between the cars out in the street. Um, now we have the ability to write reports in the cars, so that keeps officers on the street. This is the system they write them with. Um, they also have the ability to run plates, 
Um, now we're, we bring pictures up that come up. If we want to plate, the picture will come up that's used every night multiple times when people give us false names. Um, so this system is very important to us. Um, the problem is every time we have to do an upgrade for our IMC, the computer system in the station, it, this system in the cars cannot handle it. So basically what all the computer people are telling me right now, they're afraid to even do an upgrade because the system's going to crash. Um, so basically I think if action is not taken soon, the patrol division will lose, um, you know, and this crashes, they're going to lose the ability to have all these functions. So um, your consideration is deeply appreciated for this. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, Mr. Just Mayor, finishing up, Mr. President, uh, as a follow-up to the uh, conceptual recommendation, the, the intent had been to bring forward a proposed loan order for the mobile data system replacement. Uh, at this time, monies are available to fund the replacement from the debt retirement short-term interest account as a result of not borrowing for some planned items in fiscal year 2019. The utilization of unspent debt retirement account monies for acquisition of capital equipment is consistent with one of the Honorable Town Council's ongoing budget policy guideline to make annual capital expenditures equal to at least 7.5 or 8% of the operating budget in order to maintain and improve its infrastructure, facility, and equipment. So, therefore, Mr. President, members of the Council, I ask for your favorable consideration of the proposed transfer the, the, before you for $182,950 from the fiscal year. Uh, 2019 debt retirement short-term interest account to the fiscal year uh, 2019 transfer to, to capital projects police mobile da data system. Mr. President. Thank you. Can I get a motion on the transfer, please? Uh, Mr. President, I make a motion that we approve the transfer of $182,950. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? I'll roll call, please. Councilor Pelka? Yes. Councilor Feltner? Yes. Councilor Canellis? Yes. Councilor Palumbo? Yes. Councilor Piccirelli? Yes. Councilor Woodland? Yes. Councilor Bays? Yes. Councilor Donato? Yes. President Sedaris? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Next item is 10C, which is a resolution authorizing a transfer of $242,916 from the fiscal year 2019 debt retirement short-term interest account to the fiscal year 2019 transfer to capital projects library doors account in order to move forward with the replacement of the library sliding doors. Mr. Manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Again, this is uh, a follow-up to the submission of the fiscal year 20 to 24 capital improvement program. Uh, again, back in March, Town Council adopted the 29 conceptual recommendations uh, on the fiscal year 20 to 24 CIP. Uh, one of the conceptual recommendations reads as follows, was proceed with the fiscal year 2018 proposed loan order for $120,000 for library improvements to replace sliding doors. As I indicated three weeks ago tonight, the fiscal year, in the fiscal year 2020 budget message, the above of uh, the library improvements uh, for the $120,000 was bid. In the low bid, it was significantly higher than the projected uh, $120,000, and the project was being reviewed at the t time to determine how best to proceed. So follow-up to that conceptual recommendation correspondence was forwarded uh, from Mr. Tracy uh, regarding the results of the bid opening for the project, uh, along with a request to move forward with the library improvements. The two bids that were received for the project were $299,000 and 242916 uh, At this point, Mr. President, members of the Council, I'd like to bring forward uh, Ms. Leon Cole, the Library Director, to kind of provide uh, the background to this uh, kind of a long process of looking out to address uh, the, the sliding doors at the library. So, Mr. President, uh, members of the Council, Ms. Leon Cole, the Library Director. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, Replacement of the existing sliding doors at the library has been a lengthy process, as stated. Uh, it started as a simple replacement of the doors with the same type of door. But as we move through the process of finding a suitable replacement, other issues came to light, namely energy efficiency and the comfort of staff and patrons. Taking an average of 35,000 visitors a month to the library, the exist existing doors have opened and closed over 10 million times. They were the original doors in 2006. 
When we built the building, we had no expectation of that type of traffic, and the doors were never meant for that kind of volume. We've had to do significant repairs over the years, and it's past due to replace them. So we knew we had to find doors that could withstand a large volume of traffic. We also took it into consideration that we wanted to be more energy efficient and decrease the cold that came in the winter, in, during the winter, and heat in the summer. Often the circulation desk staff have to wear their coats while working on cold days. Because of the short length of the vestibules, both sets of the current sliding doors are open at the same time often, allowing the cold air in. And because the sets of doors are opposite each other across the long hallway, a sort of wind tunnel exists. With the help of the on-call architects and the building inspector, we looked at many options. The solution that would bring the greatest energy efficiency, a large revolving door like the ones at Jordan Furniture, wouldn't fit into the space. Creating that kind of space would involve a major capital project. We then looked at a smaller revolving door with a traditional door next to it, but decided that no one would likely use a revolving door. We also looked at several non-door solutions for the hallway, but none seemed appropriate or likely to be especially effective. The solution that library trustees ultimately voted to recommend is the following. Two sets of traditional swing doors at both entrances. Each will have ADA-compatible automatic door openers. At the rear entrance, which the majority of people use, the vestibule will be extended to lessen the likelihood that both sets of doors will be open at the same time. Traditional swing doors are less likely than sliding doors also to be open at the same time. We'll also install additional heating in the circulation area to make it more comfortable for staff and patrons. Also of note is that the project was bid with a stipulation that the library will re remain open throughout. We'll redirect patrons to the Thaxer Street door when one of the entrances is closed for the work. So without doing major renovation of the entrances, we feel that this solution is most likely to produce the best results. So thank you for your consideration of this transfer. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and then finally, a, again, uh, the original intent was to move forward a proposed loan order for the library improvements, uh, as indicated with the uh, mobile data for the police department. Monies are available to fund the improvement for the debt from the debt uh, short-term interest account as a result of not borrowing for some planned items in fiscal year 2019. So therefore, Mr. President, members of the Town Council, I respectively ask your favorable consideration of the proposed transfer of 242916 Mr. President. Thank you. Can I get a motion on the transfer? Uh, Mr. President, I make a motion that we approve the transfer of $242,916. Is there a second? Any discussion? Yes. Councilor, Councilor Feltner. Thank you, Mr. President, and I'm um, excited to see you moving forward on this. I just wanted to thank you for all your work. I know you, as you mentioned, a lot of diligence went into this, um, and including Commission on Disabilities, excited to see the improvements. I'm assuming it, it um, doesn't affect at all the timing of um, the alarm system of checked materials. No, that's, yeah. that's further Eight. in by the, yeah. Thank Closer you. to the elevator, yeah. Yep. Councillor Falcoff. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I just couldn't quite picture what you were describing. Okay. These will be glass doors? Yes. But, yes. They, but they'll, they'll, they won't be the sliding doors that we have now. Exactly. And the, at the rear entrance, <laughs> the vestibule will be extended. So you'll see a further extension of like the glass vestibule farther out almost to the end of the canopy at the back. So it'll be one set of doors there and then one right. set of doors where there currently are the interior so doors. So currently there's two sets of doors in the rear and one set of doors in the front of no, the library. Two. Two, both. two in both yep. places. Mm -hmm. I couldn't quite picture that. Okay, and, okay, thanks. Okay. Councilor Canales. Thank you so much. Um, so referencing the rear entrance from the parking lot, following up on Councillor uh, Falkoff, the vestibule is going to be extended out, not in? Yes, exactly. All right, so there are, there are two steps or so in the, in the vestibule area. in the area. interior. Th those steps will stay, as will the ramp. 
right. so that the interior doors will be basically at the same place where the interior slider door is now. Mm -hmm. And then that exterior slider door, which will become a traditional, traditional door, will extend out almost to the end of the canopy. And then there'll be glass on that side, you know where the sidewalk extends? So right there, there'll be a glass wall to, to enclose that area. And these are going to be traditional swing doors, two of them, I presume? Yes. And any automation in them, or are they all basically manual? No, there'll be, there'll be a button to push so you can uh, open them with the automatic door opener. Um, in both sets of doors? Yes. Great, thank yeah. you. Councilor Palumbo. Just a quick, as you were de de um, describing it, um, the uh, place where people can return books and... Yes. Um, w will that then be inside the vestibule? That will be inside, yes. So that people, will people be, won't be able to do that then late at night? or any They other? will be able to. We'll keep the outside doors open, open. Is but that what the you'll inside do? will be still I locked. I wasn't sure you are going to keep yep. the outside open. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Roll call, please. Councilor Feltner? Yes. Councilor Canellas? Yes. Councilor Palumbo? Yes. Councilor Picciarelli? Yes. Councilor Woodland? Yes. Councilor Bays? Yes. Councilor Donato? Yes. Councilor Falco? Yes. President Sedaris? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Back to the agenda. Thank you, and thanks for getting those done. Thank you. <laughs> Item number nine is a public hearing and vote on a proposed loan order authorizing the town treasurer with the approval of the town manager to borrow and or expend monies in the amount of $12,441,016 under Mass General Law, Chapter 44, Subsection 77, or pursuant to any other enabling authority for the purpose of paying costs of designer services related to the design, construction, addition to and or renovation of three elementary schools. And I won't read the rest of it because it's regular language, Mr. Manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, tonight's, uh, the presentation would be as follows. I'll provide uh, an opening and provide background information for folks at home and here. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, the, uh, the Honorable Town Council President, Mr. Sedaris, will speak as the school building committee chairman. Uh, subsequent to Mr. Sedera speaking, uh, he'll int formally introduce the principal from AI3 Architects, Mr. Dun Dunlap. And then subsequent to Mr. Dunlap's presentation, I will speak to the financing of the proposed $12 million, .4 million borrowing. Uh, and then uh, the council president would open up for public hearing. So for by way of background, back in 2017, the Watertown Public Schools had issued a, a request for services for an owner's project manager services and also a request for designer services for design, construction, addition, renovation of our three elementary schools as part of the Building for the Future initiative. Back in October of 17, the town council appropriated uh, $4 shy of $150,000 for an OPM. And then in December, the town council uh, approved a proposed loan order totaling a million three seventy eight five ninety nine for the purpose of paying designer services for the design, construction, addition, or renovation of the three elementary schools. Given those two items back in two thousand in uh, late two thousand seventeen, it was necessary to move forward the establishment of a school building committee. 13 appointments to the committee were made in March of 2018, including the Honorable Town Council President Mark Sedaris, Town Council Vice President Vincent Picciarelli, School Committee Chairman John Ports, and School Committee Member Lindsay Mosca. The committee is the representative of the town in all dealings with the architect. Uh, jumping all the way to December of 2018, the Honorable Town Council adopted and ranked the fiscal year 2020 budget policy guidelines. The top rank fiscal year 2020 budget policy guideline 2A reads as follows. Continue to develop building for the future initiative funding in collaboration with the school building committee for the three elementary school project by formalizing the proposal to use funds directed from the retirement appropriation when the pension fund is fully funded while also paying down the OPED liability and for the MSBA high school project with the proposed debt exclusion funding. Uh, during the fiscal year 2020 preliminary budget overview, 
I had indicated the school building committee has been working tirelessly to review conceptual design options for the three elementary schools in an effort to ultimately select a preferred design option that's in the best interest of the town, the taxpayers, and the successful education of our children. I'll let the uh, town council president, Sedaris, who also serves as the school building committee chairman, kind of speak more on the efforts of the school building committee in a moment. Uh, just moving forward in January, uh, end of January of 2019, the school building committee did endorse a, a, a conceptual and schematic design, including all new construction of the Hosmer and Cunniff schools and a comprehensive renovation in addition to the Lowell School. These projects are a part of a long-term vision of providing outstanding education, recreation, and healthy neighborhoods throughout Watertown will serve the town for many decades. The approximately $170 million cost estimate included the total project cost represents all the building site work, furniture, technology, and all associated costs of completed and occupied facilities. So a week later, on Jan at the end of January, I had respectively included $170 million within the fiscal year 20 to 24 capital improvement program. Subsequent to that, the Committee on Budget and Fiscal Oversight adopted conceptual recommendations. Conceptual recommendation 18 reads as follows, concur with the decision to proceed with the building for future initiative of $170 million for the three elementary schools project funding within the confines of Proposition 2 and a half. Given all of that, Mr. President, members of the Council, I had uh, brought forward three weeks ago tonight the proposed loan order for the, the $12,441,016, uh, which represents uh, the design of services to include the scope of service associated with design development through completion phases. And th at this point, that would be the opening remarks, setting the, uh, from background standpoint of view at this point. Uh, Mr. Town Council President, I'd like to have you speak uh, now as the school building uh, chairman. I'm going to do something I normally don't do, and I'm going to go to the podium. Oof. This is important. <laughs> Thanks for allowing me, Mr. Manager, to take my turn here. I'm speaking to the members of the council, the members of the community tonight as the school building committee chairperson. And I want to give a little bit of a background how we got here, where we are, and then introduce Scott, who's been key to getting us where we want to be with our schools. Um, this is basically the first time that this full council is going to see where we are. And I think it's important. Also this evening, this is a, the first significant commitment to making these elementary school projects come to fruition. So I'm going to start by saying thank you for allowing this to happen. Thank you for your support through the Budget and Fiscal Oversight Committee and your budget rankings. I, I do think it's very important for this community, and I want to emphasize the fact that we are doing this without an override. That's also significant, and it also shows that the financial management that we've had, the restraint that we've had through the years of people saying that we didn't support our schools or we, should pay, we shouldn't pay off our retirement. Well, we did support our schools and we did support pay off our retirement, which will be paid off on July 1st. So all of those are very important. I, I want to thank my building committee, five of which members are here this evening, for all the hard work since March of last year. We've met many, many times. We've met at the schools. We've met here. We, we really have done a lot of work to get to this point. Um, so I want to thank them for their commitment to this project and to the, the goals that we've set forth. As you're well aware, when we first brought Scott in, we were working with figures that the manager continues to discuss, which were 80 to $120 million. While the building committee was meeting, we found that 80 to $120 million didn't get us a whole lot. We started looking at renovations. Then we said, well, why would we leave some windows here and, and not change all the windows? And it became more apparent with, with Scott's expertise, and I find that Scott has been key to getting us where we are today. Um, it became apparent that 80 to $120 million wasn't going to cut it. So I asked Scott, and the building committee talked to Scott about Let's take a look at what it would be if we designed, it, let's say, one new school, maybe the Connor for the Hosmer. Where would we be? 
And then it became apparent that maybe we should look at two new schools. And we didn't want to touch the Lowell because of the historic aspect. That school is a, a very beautiful building. And it became, when we started doing analysis of the numbers, the difference between what we were going to get by doing renovations and what we we're going to get by doing new schools, that delta became very, very small. It's a, it's a big delta, but it's, it became much smaller and much more apparent to us that this was a direction that we should be moving in. It also gives us an opportunity, and, we, and through this whole process, we've been hearing from several people in the community, groups and community that are concerned about sustainability. We created a sustainability subcommittee, which John Ports chairs, and they've been working. We're actually now at a point where we're looking at potentially net zero buildings and lead silver and above buildings, the new two new buildings, which is a huge accomplishment, working within the budget that with the parameters that have been set by the manager using Scott's real numbers. I think you're going to be excited tonight. Scott's going to show you where we started out, what we were looking at, and where we are as of last week. Um, it shows you some really nice designs. I will say that when we started out, some of the neighbors in the areas were coming to these meetings very frustrated. And when Scott started developing these designs, the neighbors are now, as of last week, I asked one of them who was one of the direct neighbors at the Hosmer, what do you think? I love it. I love it. They continue to say how much they love this. So I think we've done, a, as a committee, we've done a good job trying to get people engaged. And with Scott's help, we've been addressing the issues that continue to be raised. And the sustainability issues, we got a letter from Watertown for Climate Change thanking us for our efforts to try to do uh, what we're doing for all of the environmental issues that we're facing. So at this point, I want to introduce Scott Dunlap, who's been here before from AI3. And I'm very confident that you'll be happy once you hear his presentation. And I'm, favor I'm asking, from my perspective, for your favorable consideration to move forward with this loan order to begin the process and really set uh, our schools on the path that we want to go. Thank you. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Council President, also known to me as Mr. Building Committee Chair, <laughs> members of the Town Council, Mr. Town Manager, thank you. Give me just a moment. Plugged in. the Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. As the um, as building committee chairman, Sedaris mentioned, it certainly has been a, a long road and an enormous amount of time invested by the building committee in taking a look at every possible option for the town of Watertown. And certainly know that I've seen each of your faces on numerous occasions joining us at the neighborhood forums and at building committee meetings and at various community input opportunities. So I want to thank you for all that. It's, it's really difficult to describe the move that the town of Watertown is preparing to do, preparing to make with the three elementary schools because it really is a model for many towns to, to follow. I've been doing this for almost 30 years. I've worked all over the Commonwealth, all over New England, and all over the world. And I have to say that the commitment that is being promote, proposed for the three elementary schools in terms of restoring the neighborhoods, returning green space, um, creating an environment that is much better for each of these Watertown neighborhoods, 
the educational commitment in terms of the innovative environments that are going to be created for teaching and learning, the sustainability standard that's being established in terms of placing net zero as a goal is, um, is almost unheard of. It's becoming something that a lot of cities and towns want to do and want to accomplish. It appears Watertown may be on the brink of doing that. So I just can't say enough about the direction that the building committee has uh, proposed and the direction that this council has continued to support. As, as you know, um, after all of the master planning and all of the discussion and all the years of prior planning, in 2017, the current process was launched. Um, as the council president and building committee chair indicated, we spent the end of 2017 and early 2018 completing some initial work in the form of site investigations, topographical and boundary surveys, geotechnical work on the site, soil characterization, really just gathering data on the site. And then as the building committee formed in early 2018 and began meeting, we started developing conceptual options for each of the projects. And I'm going to show a few samples of some of the options tonight that in no way represents the various options that were considered. Almost uh, no stone went unturned in taking a look at the possibilities on all the sites. And I'm going to be showing just some three-dimensional modeling of those options, but keep in mind that the building committee do took a deep dive into every single option and looked at detailed floor plans, phasing options, detailed cost. There was an enormous amount of time spent on every single option, vetting it out with the neighbors and the neighborhood, the community members to talk about the advantages and disadvantages and parking and circulation and green space and saving trees, and the list goes on and on in terms of the number of I items that were investigated as part of each one of those conceptual options. We continued to do that, um, ultimately leading to some official neighborhood forums. Uh, certainly all of the building committee members were open for public input, but we went out to the individual neighborhoods and solicited input in, uh, in the fall. And then we rolled into a preferred schematic phase where we were looking in more detail at all those conceptual options. And then ultimately, as the building com committee chair indicated, we went back, we were asked by the building committee to go back and take an even more detailed look at some prior discussions on the possibility of new construction on the Cuniff and the Hosmer site, and even the possibility of reducing the amount of construction on the Lull site to improve the overall quality of that project. So all of that culminated in, uh, in January of this year. I'll quickly just show some of the kind of conceptual options to give you a sense of all the things that were considered. Again, this is just a sampling of some of the options, and the building committee dove into a lot more detail on each of them. A uh, sample of a renovation addition option at the kind of site where we were proposing to leave a portion of the existing building and expand it. A different variety of that option. Some of the new construction options at one point in time, we were exploring the possibility of leaving the existing Cuniff and trying to construct completely outside of it with a new facility. Same thing in a different arrangement. Partially constructing in the footprint of the existing Cuniff. A variation on renovations in multiple locations and additions um, surrounding several different locations on the site. Another variation on renovation. Hosmer, same thing, leaving a portion of the Hosmer and doing a new addition. New additions always represented by the piece in white, I should have pointed out. New addition with a different arrangement, elimination of the Z-shaped building, all new construction outside of the current footprint of the Hosmer. Addition more compact and directly adjacent to the the Hosmer, the existing Hosmer with the demolition of the Z-shaped building. All new construction at the Hosmer, unfortunately displacing a key area of the play fields. 
but an option that was considered. Another all new construction at the Hosmer. Um, unfortunately, not a very popular location in the end and some compromises associated with that option. More detailed forming and massing of a proposed new construction option at the Hosmer. The law, we considered multiple uh, addition locations and configurations, the front and the rear, each side, each side and more addition at the rear. Ultimately, after evaluating all of those, and again, I would point out that there was a lot more detailed information considered and many more options considered, but just to give you a sense of that. And then we moved into what Chairman Sedaris described as a mode of looking at the possibility of all new construction on the kind of site. In this case, if we were able to do all new construction, move the building closer to the cemetery, free up an enormous amount of additional green space, um, recreate all the parking, recreate all the stormwater um, drainage on the site, do a completely new site package, do a building that would support a large photovoltaic array in the form of solar power, uh, do a lead gold potentially building in terms of energy efficiency, configure everything in an ideal fashion on the interior in terms of supporting 21st century education. This was the scheme that was reviewed at the CONIF. Then at the Hosmer, when we did the same thing and said all new construction, place it anywhere you want to get the most perfect fit on the site and create the most green space and the best circulation and the best parking around the site and the best possible educational conditions for the students. And this was, in fact, the scheme and the model for that. At the low, um, condensing the addition to um, the smallest possible addition and still meeting all the ed educational program, slight adjustment in the enrollment, enrollment there and a shift allowed us to free up, again, a lot of green space that was previously going to get displaced, avoid an addition in this area, and this became the preferred scheme for the law. And then as we moved further into schematic design for those, they began to get very much more real. Here, here you can see the evolving site plan for the Hosmer site. Where we've got new building, learning gardens, outdoor learning courtyards, uh, completely able to save existing play fields. In fact, recreating new play fields and better orientation, uh, new play areas and better orientations much more green space in that neighborhood turned over to the neighborhood surroundings, better drop off and circulation around the site. Um, every possible improvement included as part of that uh, ultimate option that was selected. This is the um, exterior as we're moving on into um, design development now. This is literally that building viewed from this parking and drop-off area. So we're looking at the new K-5 to entry and the new early childhood learning entry because this is early childhood learning building. This is K-5 to building. We're looking at the fronts of those from this green space or this play area in this image. So you see the new K-5 to entry, the new early childhood learning center entry. You see the glass bridge connecting the two buildings, the outdoor learning courtyard between the two buildings. This is looking from Mount Auburn Street. Um, we're up close to the building, but if you were looking from Mount Auburn Street and you walked across the fields and you were standing in approximately this location, looking at the building, that's the view that you're getting here, where we've got the academic core, we've got the art room on this end, we've got the dining area with some outdoor student dining located here in the beginning of the play fields. At the Cunniff site, the newly proposed building, uh, minimizing its footprint and going to three stories, allowed for much more green space, better parking and circulation. It also allowed us to create this building, much more energy efficient. Again, a large roof platform for photovoltaics array in an effort to make this a net zero building. And we, we say net zero, I should explain. Net zero 
essentially means that the building will attempt to produce um, enough energy from its photovoltaic or its solar array on the roof to power the entire building. At the low, again, a reminder that we consolidated the addition to this location, a small addition in the rear, outdoor learning courtyard created between the addition and the um, existing original primary facade of the building. And then you can see what that actually looks and feels like here. Obviously the original building, this is the proposed addition. It ends up being a learning commons for students surrounded by classrooms in this particular area, and then an outdoor learning courtyard with the learning gardens. And then this is the building as you move um, on past. You could see, the, if you could go a little further, you'd see the existing library and media center um, on that side of the building. What happens next um, with, the, um, with the council support, the project would move on into design development um, so we're approximately here. We're another year away from completing design development and the construction documents for all three projects. At that point in time, all three projects would be complete in terms of their design and documentation and ready to bid. The current schedule proposes approximately two years for the construction of the Hosmer, approximately a year for the construction of the Cunniff, and approximately 18 months for the lull, a large portion of which would overlap with the Cunniff construction. That would be the addition at the lull. I would point out that the building committee is also exploring options for possibly accelerating this schedule and having, uh, in particular, the lull potentially finished earlier, but it's a little too early to make any commitment on that until we have a chance to look at the much more detailed design phasing look at the impacts, et cetera, um, on what that would be. But always exploring options for um, maintaining quality and maintaining um, a safe school environment, but completing the projects as quickly as possible. So looking at that now, um, if this schedule were to be um, held as is, the assumption is all projects would be completed in the summer of 2024, with the last one being the low as it wrapped up. I know that's an enormous amount of information in a very short period of time. Uh, thank you for allowing me to go through it. Okay, before we open it up, I want to go back to the manager for the financing portion. Mr. Okay. Manager. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. President, uh, members of the town council. Uh, first, I'd like to say uh, I, the school building committee chairman, the council president, reminded me about the 80 to $120 million. I still would prefer the 80 to 120 to the, uh, uh, but that being said, uh, this is a very, very exciting night. And, and before talking about how we're gonna pay for this, I, I need to uh, thank uh, several groups or four thank yous, if you will, before I talk about financing. The first one uh, is, the gentleman who just finished the presentation, Mr. Dunlap, uh, in all the years that I've sat in this chair, uh, it's been few and far between, and I don't think it ever has been, where we've had somebody come in and basically uh, provide with full confidence to this community and having people rally around his thoughts. Uh, he's very, very bright. He is very personable, but he is really talented. So that's my first thank you. The second thank you is to the members of the school building committee. We talked about how I indicated before how they work tirelessly to review conceptual design options for the three elementary schools in an effort to ultimately select the preferred design option is in the best interest of the town, the taxpayers, in the successful education of our children. Think about it. They became in existence in March of 2018, met 20 times, had three community forums, and uh, Mr. Dunlap showed the, the, how it morphed from uh, elementary, from renovating into what we end up with two new schools. 
and renovating the expansion of the third school. Um, so again, they, they've worked, they've done, they've done their homework, they've done, they've had presentations, the council president alluded to, hearing from residents that were not pleased with the, the Hosmer neighbors that seem to be very pleased now. The next group I wanna thank is the Honorable Town Council uh, for their leadership on two items I touched upon before, the fiscal year 2020 budget policy guideline, which certainly uh, was ranked number one and talked about continue to develop building for the future initiative funding in collaboration with the school building committee for the three elementary schools. Additionally, following up to that, the town council adopted conceptual recommend num uh, number 18 that basically said it concurred with the decision to proceed with the building for the future uh, to the tune of $170 million. So how do we pay for it? We pay for it on, as outlined on page 22, the fiscal year 2020 budget three weeks ago tonight. The three highlights of the fiscal year 2020 budget for the community are fully funded retirement system as of July 1, 2019, uh, I do find it funny that the council president alluded to and thinking back, there was a lot of folks that were not thrilled that from fiscal year 2009 to 2019, the Honorable Town Council appropriated 152% to the retirement appropriation. That'll be fully funded in July 1. We set up a payment plan to address the unfunded OPED liability and then lastly, and most importantly for tonight, the funding of the three elementary schools. As a result of that aggressive funding in the retirement system, the financing of the $170 million for the three elementary school project will begin in fiscal year 2020, and all this project will be done within the confines of Proposition 2 and a half. Borrowing of the $170 million is projected to be done in phases beginning in fiscal year 20 through fiscal year 23. Uh, and we outlined that yesterday and tonight is the, is the big first step. But uh, the last group I wanted to mention is the taxpayers of Watertown for their support. When you think about it, this is all being done within the confines of Proposition 2 and a half. We're utilizing tax dollars within the confines of 2 and a half to build two new schools and renovate it, expand another. So, Mr. President, uh, prior to open up for the public hearing, I respectfully request the town council's favorable consideration in moving forward with the endorsed conceptual and schematic design the school building had voted back at the end of January. The projects are part of a long-term vision of providing outstanding education, recreation, healthy neighborhoods throughout Watertown and will serve this community for many decades. The, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. This is a public hearing, so I now open it up for the public, for anyone that would like to make comments. Please identify yourself, John, for those that don't know who you are. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, my name's John Ports. I live at Robbins Road. I'm uh, chair of the school committee. So uh, let me just say on, on behalf of the school committee, uh, I, I wanna thank the town manager for, for his kind of insight and, and work on making this come to the point that we have today. I wanna to thank the, the uh, town council for all of their support uh, in anticipation of a positive vote uh, this evening. Uh, I wanna thank the administration, the superintendent, the administration, and as the manager said, thanks also to this community. I mean, the, the commitment that Watertown has made to education uh, is is uh, truly amazing. I mean, it's it's something to ve be very proud of in this community, in a, in this town. I mean, just a, a quick, and I mentioned this to the to the uh, council president earlier. The superintendent and I were at a, a forum last night, yesterday evening. Senator uh, Brownsberger put together a forum on education funding for his district, and the, the three communities in his district are Watertown, Belmont, and Boston. And so we made a little presentation and we followed Boston. So Boston has a $1.2 billion budget and then we talked. <laughs> um, so we're kind of the little kids on the block, but um, uh, we, it was interesting. What, what, what the, the, one of the key takeaways from that meeting was very clear 
that the commitment in Watertown to support education is, is truly uh, incredible and very, very impressive. I mean, Boston was complaining about all the stuff they're facing. Belmont was complaining about everything that they were facing. Didi and I felt guilty <laughs> getting up there because we were saying, well, we have some of that. We have coaches and um, instructional coaches, and we have some social work. We have an incredible education system thanks to your support, the manager's support, and the town council's support. So it's really, the, the commitment was outstanding. I will say, as I walked out of that meeting last night, the, the chairman of the, the Boston School Committee asked if we could send a little money his way. <laughs> so I, I was going to give him your, ad, your email address. Has, Shut down. Um, but I, again, I, you know, the commitment that, that you're making uh, to Watertown is, is great. I mean, it's on the operating budget, too, which was, was the focus of this meeting. It was kind of Chapter 70 foundation budget. Um, uh, but the commitment here tonight to the capital side, to the building side, is, uh, is equally impressive, if not more so. You know, we're on a very important and exciting path. We're on the beginning of it. We've got, I'll, I'll be here uh, more times, I think, than just this tonight. But the buildings that, that Scott, and let me thank Scott also for his work, uh, the, but the buildings that, that he showed up on the screen here are ones that will, uh, in ways we haven't had for a long time, support the teaching and learning that goes on in Watertown, that will support the collaboration for student learning, support collaboration for teachers, it will meet sustainability goals. Uh, they will be true assets, and I think, uh, for this community. Uh, so I'm very proud of the, the work that we've done so far. Thank you to the other building committee members, uh, and thank you for uh, your support uh, for this project. <coughs> Just tell everybody who you are. For those that don't know, please, thank you. So thank you, um, I am Dee Dee Galston. I'm the superintendent of schools here in Watertown. Um, I just want to um, echo the, the thanks to the town council, but certainly the larger Watertown community for supporting education in this monumental way. Um, and this funding, or the potential funding, marks a major milestone for us in the building projects. Um, and one of the um, strategic objectives that we have within our school system is to build educationally appropriate and joyful learning environments and I think the initial work that we've seen from our architects um, and the school building committee certainly points to that high level of success um, with achieving that objective but I, I do want to mention something and, and just hearing and, and watching and seeing and thinking about the commitment that you've provided to education it makes me feel deeply responsible um, and so I just want to make sure that you know that a school building is only as good as the teaching and learning that happens within it. Um, and I'm here to, to guarantee or promise or commit to you all um, on behalf of the school administration, we have principals here, our assistant superintendent, um, that we will ensure that what happens inside of these buildings is equally excellent, um, innovative, and joyful as what we've seen tonight in the presentation in these new and or renovated buildings. So just thank you very much. And I take that responsibility seriously, and I promise that we will do our best to equal that. So thank you. Anyone else wish to be heard? Seeing none, I close the public hearing, ask for a motion to discuss uh, this. So a motion on the proposed loan order. Uh, Mr. President, I make a motion that we approve the loan order for $12,441,016. Is there a second? Okay, discussion, questions? Councilor Donato. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I really, there are definitely a lot of people who need to be recognized and thanked. Uh, the school building committee, I, I know they've met at this point well over 20 times. Uh, I have not been able to attend all of the meetings. I've tried to get to as many as possible. Um, and we're, we're lucky to have a lot of members of the administration and town council and school committee on that uh, the school building committee but the town residents who applied and interviewed for those positions are an incredibly talented group of people who have given so much of their time and talents to, to this committee and to the town 
Uh, they deserve so much thanks. I'm always so impressed um, by the questions they ask, and uh, we are really lucky to have them. Uh, we are equally lucky to have Scott involved in this project. Um, every meeting I've been to, there there have been you know numerous questions, and Scott's grasp of the material is so strong that I've never seen him stumped by one question. And more importantly, um, as we discussed or, or was mentioned in the presentation, um, early on there was some resident pushback to, to certain designs and I could completely understand uh, their concern. And Scott always answered all of those questions uh, with such uh, understanding and respect. And I think that residents really felt as though they were heard, and I, I think they appreciated that. So uh, we're, we're definitely lucky to have Scott on board. Um, I, I think one question we often receive is, with all this development and all the um, new growth in town, where are my tax dollars going to? And it's really difficult to point to a fully funded pension system because it's, it's not a tangible item that you can point to. And I understand that concern because I often have that concern myself, but um, based on what uh, previous town councils have done with the help of uh, the town manager and Mr. Tracy, uh, we're, we're gonna be able to point to two brand new buildings and one extremely renovated building and to be able to point to the residents in town and say that's what your tax dollars paid for and that's what the new growth uh, paid for, and I think that that's going to be an incredible accomplishment, especially when you consider several of our neighboring cities and towns are constantly going back to their residents for overrides for operating budget issues, and we're going to be able to build two new buildings and significantly uh, renovate the third all within the confines of Prop 2.5, and, and that is such an amazing accomplishment. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this project. I think between the school building committee and uh, AI3, I think we're in great hands. Uh, and I'm really excited to, to see uh, the future of the school systems in Watertown. So I will definitely be supporting this tonight. Thank you. Any other comments? Councilor Feltner. Thank you, um, Council President. I would just say that I uh, and believer that the, the families and the schools, our education, um, are the lifeblood of our community. So I'll be happily supporting this and excited of all the work on everybody that's everything that's been mentioned and feel privileged to be part of the council to be able to vote on this. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Councilor Picciarelli. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, so this, uh, this is something we've been working on a long time. Um, and I am so pleased that we're actually at this point tonight, we're actually voting to uh, move forward with the design for the construction. Um, this, the, it takes, you know, to, to live, in a, to live in, a, in a great community, you need to have a vision, but it's more than just the vision. You need to have teamwork to put that vision into practice. But you also need to have the discipline to sort of stick with the process and get it done. And, and, and I think th what, what we're voting on here tonight is, you know, looking back, it almost seems, based on Scott's presentation, it seems almost too easy. Um, and it sort of belies the, the, the effort that's gone on to this. When we started this process back in sort of 2012 with, with the concept of renovating our schools, um, but the, the discipline to stick with the, the, the process, the, the commitment to process, and just uh, keep moving, the, moving it forward and making decisions. There were a lot of hard decisions this uh, being made. Um, one of the hardest decisions was to go from the uh, $120 million to $153 million to $170 million. And um, many people in the community were very concerned about that. But it comes down to, the commitment to the, the process to actually say what value we're going to get out of this for the community. And, and, and I think for $170 million, we're going to be creating a tremendous amount of value for this community. 
and we're doing it with the discipline of uh, having the finances to make it happen. And, and I think that is a testament to the teamwork, not just the school building committee and the architect, but the town manager and his financial staff uh, and the, the town auditor. And you know, even going back 10 years ago, working with the, the, the Watertown Contributory Retirement Board um, to actually develop a funding schedule for the pension plan. And, and I'm not sure there's not many people in this room who would have thought in 2008 or 2009 that the effort we put into the funding, fully funding our pension system would result in a $170 million school project without an override. But it was there, and we did it, and we had the discipline to stick with it. So I, I'm, I'm hoping uh, that we can get this done, get this moving forward, and actually set the groundwork for starting the high school project, which is going to be coming faster than you think. Um, but anyway, I, 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 could, I could not be happier with, with the amount of teamwork and discipline that, that everyone in this town has shown. And I, one of the, you know, the last thing is you know, we spend a lot of time looking at the outsides of the building. Uh, but what's going on inside the buildings, what's being proposed for the educational uh, environment uh, for our children is just as exciting as what you see about the outside of the building. And I know there wasn't enough time tonight to, to go through the inside, what's going on proposed to the inside of the building, but that is as exciting as what you've seen for the outsides of the building. So anyway, that's, uh, I'm, I'm so enthusiastic about moving forward with this. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Let me just close by pointing out one thing, and uh, the teamwork is part of it, um, but by no means was this a just walk into the manager's office and say, hey, uh, Mr. Manager, we're at 170, we need the money. We had to, we had to work very hard, to, and the manager works very hard, and this council works very hard to protect and do the right thing for the taxpayers of this community. And the manager, after getting, sitting down with myself and Scott, was made aware that what we were getting for the increase in costs was the right thing to do for this community. So I'm really proud of that, and I think we can move forward, and uh, this is a good night for Watertown. So can I get a roll call, please? Councilor Canellas? Yes. Councilor Palumbo? Yes. Councilor Picciarelli? Yes. Councilor Woodland? Yes. Councilor Bays? Yes. Councilor Donato? Yes. Councilor Falcoff? Yes. Councilor Feltner? Yes. President Sedaris? Yes, thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thanks to all. Thanks to all the members of the building committee, too, for being here. Okay. You're dismissed. <laughs> The next item on the agenda is the committee reports. 11A is the Committee on Human Services report regarding the reappointment of Richard Arnold to the Board of Health for a term to expire uh, February 22nd, 2022. Councilor Palumba. Thank you. Uh, the committee, in a, a committee met on April 23rd at 645 in the town council office in attendance were council, myself, Councilor Bays, Vice Chair Susan Falkoff. Councilor Falkoff, Secretary Larry Random, Health Director Richard Arnold, the Board of Health Member and Resident Elodia Thomas. The purpose of the meeting was to interview Richard Arnold for reappointment to the Board of Health. Mr. Arnold has served three year, two three-year terms on the board and is looking forward to continuing. The greatest challenge he has faced is working on the biotechnological regulations since uh, he is a medical professional currently serving as an administrator of student health services at UMass Boston, and the regula uh, regulating laboratory work is outside his expertise. He said that the board, working with the director of the health department, is looking at the regulations of surrounding communities and the state regulations and choosing the relevant sections to create Watertown's regulations. Several experts have submitted helpful comments to the health director. The committee asked about opportunities and procedures for public input, input at the Board of Health meetings and compared the board's procedures to town council mechanisms. Noting there needs to be an opportunity for public input as well as board deliberation. Council has expressed the importance of the board obtaining all the information it needs for good decision making. 
Councillor Farkoff made a motion to recommend council, to, to the full council approval for Mr. Reynolds, uh, Mr. Arnold's reappointment with the term expiring on February, that should be read February 7 instead of February 22nd, uh, 2022. Council Bay second and the motion carried three to zero, respectfully submitted by Councillor Susan Falkoff, secretary. Thank you. Can I get a motion to accept the report? Uh, Mr. President, I make motion to accept the report uh, amended with uh, February 22nd to read February 7th. Second. Any discussion on the report? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. And the action item, can I get a motion on the reappointment of Richard Arnold to the Board of Health? Uh, uh, motion to reappoint Richard Arnold to the Board of Health for a term to expire February 7th, 2022. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, 11B is the Committee on Rules and Ordinances report regarding liquor licenses for Arsenal Yards and their related fees, Councilor Donato. Thank you, Mr. President. The Committee on Rules and Ordinances met on uh, Wednesday, April 17th at 5 p.m. in the Philippine hearing room, uh, lower level. Uh, present were myself as chair, Councilor Kenneth Woodland, vice chair, and Councilor Lisa Feltner, secretary. Also present were Andrew Coppolati from Boylston Properties, uh, attorney Bill York, Council President Mark Sedaris, Councillor Palumba, uh, Mr. David Stokes, and Charlie Bright Rose. Uh, the agenda for the evening was one, to review the fees of liquor licenses granted pursuant to Chapter 73 of the Acts of 2016. Uh, and, and, excuse me, and then uh, number two, review, consider, and recommend appropriate legislative action uh, in regard to the need for additional licenses for the sale of alcoholic beverages on the premises pursuant to section 12 of General Laws Chapter 138. Um, I called the meeting to order by giving a brief background on the origin of the referral from President Sedaris, which was based on correspondence from Attorney York for Arsenal Yards and Cinema World beginning late last year, uh, copies of which are attached to the minutes. Uh, I also suggested discussing the second agenda item first. Watertown was granted the ability to issue an additional 15 liquor licenses by the State Act of 2016, which specifically allowed for eight of the 15 licenses to be issued to five specific areas within Watertown, one of which was the Arsenal Corridor Regional Malls, and now, which now includes Arsenal Yards. This was before the RMUD zoning district was created. Uh, of these eight area designated licenses, six remain as two have been granted, one to Joyful Gardens Restaurant located within the Watertown Mall, and the other to uh, Flaming Pit, which is located at 222 Arsenal Street. Given the Arsenal Yards plans to provide a larger mix of restaurant choices, they would like to secure the remaining six licenses as well as an additional nine liquor licenses if possible. After discussion about protecting uh, quote unquote traditional restaurant owned licenses and the timing and planning of Arsenal Yards, the committee decided uh, they were open to petitioning the legislature for more liquor licenses. Councilors agreed the most expedient approach would likely be to amend the provisions of the home rule petition language and request a total of 30 liquor licenses in section one and 23 licenses in section two. Um, it was decided that I would uh, consult with uh, attorney David Dineski of KP Law, who's the licensing attorney for the town, and uh, would then subsequently include this in the report to the town council. The committee then began discussing liquor license fees and the differences between licenses owned by an establishment versus those added under Chapter 73 of the Act of 2016, which also stipulates that the town council sets the fees. But the council did not previously deliberate or set these fees, and Watertown did not anticipate the current development project or how the needs for planning a large mixed-use project with particular leasing and financing requirements might differ. Different perspectives were shared between the committee and attendees, including fairness to paying for a license without being able to use it for a year or more period, especially given larger construction realities. 
fairness to current regular quote unquote license owners and fairness to small businesses, new businesses, and economic incentives. It was also noted that this is a unique situation, one that Watertown has not experienced before. Given the lack of consensus on setting fees per Chapter 73, the committee agreed to continue this agenda item to a future meeting. Uh, Councilor Woodland made a motion to recommend the town council requests 15 additional liquor licenses from the state legislature. This was seconded by Councilor Feltner and the motion passed three to zero. Uh, Councilor Woodland then made a motion to adjourn the meeting on agenda item two and continue committee meeting on agenda item one. This was seconded by Councilor Feltner. The motion passed three to zero. Uh, the minutes were respect respectfully submitted by Lisa Feltner. Uh, attachments to the minutes are the letters previously referenced uh, from Attorney York to Council President Sedaris. Also some correspondence from Boylston Properties. Um, and then uh, post-meeting uh, that was alluded to earlier, I did have a conversation with Attorney Dineski to confirm um, his previous belief that amending the acts of 2016 would be uh, the most appropriate uh, course for this council to take. Uh, he responded in the affirmative. A copy of that email correspondence is attached to the minute meetings as well as a um, draft of the proposed language uh, that this council should act on, which would uh, then, um, uh, upon approval of this council, would uh, then go forward to the state legislature for approval. And that is the report, Mr. President. I do just want to uh, point out at, on page one of the minutes, um, under agenda one, uh, should read chaps, uh, chapter 73 of the acts of uh, 2016 as opposed to uh, 2106. Okay. Thank you. Can I get a motion to accept the report with that amendment? Uh, so moved. Is there a second? second? Any discussion? Yes. Oh, no, not on the report. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The next is, can I get a motion on the action item? Mr. President, make a motion that uh, the town council request uh, pursuing 15 additional liquor licenses from the state legislature. Is there a second? second. Councilor Falkoff. Thank you, President Sedaris. So I was really shocked to read in the Watertown Mass News that they were asking for nine additional licenses, uh, or, if, or is it, are the fifth, okay, clarification, the 15 are all for the Arsenal Project, or is it just nine for the Arsenal Project? Councilor Donato. Uh, Mr. That. President, um, so the, the council was, or the, the committee was very cognizant of the fact that um, there, Arsenal Yards was looking to not only take the six that are, remain outstanding, but they would like an additional nine. Okay. So they need a total of 15, okay. and the concern on the committee level was that. Um, we wanted to make sure that there was still those additional six licenses uh, to guard against future development possibilities in the Arsenal corridor. So I read this, that they wanted to have 15 licenses at that project, and I was sort of shocked by the large number, and I thought that the minutes would help me understand better why they felt they needed that much drinking, and they didn't, and I'm having a hard time thinking there should be that many establishments with liquor licenses in this one place. Okay, Councilor Woodland. Just in response to that, the additional 15 is not designated strictly for the Arsenal area. Uh, by amending the legislation, uh, there's a subsection four in Part B that highlights four different areas that could have these additional licenses. Uh, so it's not necessarily just in that one spot, but they did provide a list of the establishments that are currently uh, seeking licenses and uh, a smaller list of potential license um, holders coming in. And it's uh, all different types of establishments, uh, you know, mostly restaurants and, uh, you know, movie theater, things of that nature. Um, but, you know, that number is kind of what they've been proposing for a little while now. Uh, but again, it, it just wanted to emphasize that it's opened up to more than just the Arsenal area, this number. I, I will be voting no. I just think that's too many licenses. Thank you. Councilor Canales. Thank you. Um, 
when the permitting process started for Arsenal Yards, many of you may remember my communication to the planning board indicating, and I quote, that this was a city within a city. And I still feel that way. And the same was true for Athena Health. Uh, both developments wanted to entice people onto their properties, retain their employees and their and their prospective tenants to be on site and to have all of the amenities. But I strongly feel that we should also be taking into consideration all of the other small establishments, <clears throat> excuse me, within our 4.17 square miles. Speaking for the East End, we all know the, the Tufts property that was formerly Prospectus, and form, prior to that it was the Western Electric Building. When the property was purchased by Tufts, the merchants in Coolidge Square and the surrounding area were very excited that this would generate additional foot traffic, uh, the employees being going into the, uh, the areas and, and patronizing, didn't materialize. Then Tufts became the corporate headquarters relocating from Waltham. More optimism that there would be more foot traffic, more people patronizing the local establishments. Maybe a little bit, but not much. Not the kind of traffic that was anticipated. I have concerns for the mom and pop establishments in our, in our community, whether it be on the south side or the west end or in the east end of Watertown. And granted, we now want the arsenal yards to, to be successful. We're into it. There's no backing out. It's certainly um, an area that's being developed. And we need it to be successful for the benefit of our community. But we also have to be very cognizant of what's going on in the rest of our community. We do not want to see vacant storefronts. We do not want to see establishments that, that have been part of our community, where the owners are residents of our community, to, to feel deprived and to eventually consider closing their doors. Because I have heard this. Because other establishments are hurting. So I will not be supporting the, addition, the additional licenses at Arsenal Yards. This project continuously evolves, and there are changes after changes. And I think they have to, uh, they being the developers, need to remain within the parameters that they personally established and requested of our community. Thank you. Councilor Palumba. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to, something Councilor, um, Woodland said that I wasn't unclear of, so I'm looking at the amendment that Councillor uh, Donato worked out with, uh, with the attorney. I, I understood that these 15 additional licenses were for um, Arsenal Yards. Um, now, if they're, are they for the whole Armud area, or are they are for, it was unclear to me. Mr. President. Councillor Donato. Um, if you, if you, I think uh, there had been uh, some correspondence with Attorney Dineski, and the, the question was whether or not we were going to uh, be proposing a new home rule petition or if we were going to seek to amend the existing. Right. And the recommendation was that if we, we were going to just add the number town-wide, then we could do just an amendment, that that would probably be the, the, the best approach. If they were going to be specifically designated for Arsenal Yards, the suggestion was that it would be a new home rule petition. So the way we tried to structure the language was that those f it would be an additional 15 in town, but by amending the language that Councillor uh, Woodland referenced before that limited the Arsenal Quarters Mall or however it was designated to a maximum of eight, we amended that language as well to go up to 23 to include not only the additional uh, licenses that Arsenal Yards thinks they might need, but we wanted to make sure that we did have a buffer so that if there was further development on Arsenal Street that those future restaurants would not be frozen out of the process because Arsenal Yards would be, um, you know, requiring so many licenses. So if I understand the amendment as, as it's in the minutes to, uh, in the report, um, we're going for a total of 30 licenses as amended, yes. uh, big 30 licenses, and that um, 23 of those licenses would be available in town. 
Um, so it would be, so where the 15 have already been approved? Yes. We're, we're going for an additional 15. So that gives us a total of, of 30. 30 that could be issued under the chapter 73. Um, but the, the, it's just setting the cap for the Arsenal corridor at 23. I got it. Thank you. Appreciate it. This, this also makes available the, the other ones for Pleasant Street right. Right. and other right. potential new developments. We do have one specific for Pleasant Street, but there right. may be more than one. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I think the committee, I went to the meeting, the committee thought it was an opportunity. And, and I, I don't want to speak for anybody, but I do feel that this is the same kind of thing that happened in Somerville at Assembly Row, where they didn't realize that the project was going to become much more than they originally anticipated. And I think that was why the request was made to look at this. Um, so. Thank you for clarifying. Any other comments? Councilor Bays. Um, so I'm just tr trying to remember, isn't the number of liquor licenses we have, is that tied to the number of marijuana? No. Is, it's not? OK, I, th I thought I'd remember. It, it, it's, yes. Yeah. And, and the liquor licenses, uh, the, the traditional liquor licenses are tied to population. Right. And the marijuana licenses are tied to the liquor licenses. Right, that's what I was, that's what I was asking. Not the way you said. Okay, well, I meant it that yes. way. So, so does this double? No, this, no. The, this, the, those marijuana licenses would go only for the traditional number. Okay, okay. Councillor Feltner. Well, um, I guess two quick points. One, um, somewhat to uh, Councillor Falkoff's question, partly why they, it, it seems like a lot is because they're wanting to have more variety and smaller establishments that possibly local owners or small businesses versus, you know, just a couple very large restaurants that might be part of a national chain. So it's a more, provides more variety and flexibility. Um, they may only end up needing 13, but the, it's uh, a little bit of a chicken and egg between when you're building a large project and timing of the leases and, and their needs for getting financing. There was discussion around that. The other point is just a reminder that there's different type of liquor license. So there's the licenses that are owned by restaurants. And these are <clears throat> the other type where the town would still be approving. It's, it's in effect the town leasing the licenses. So the town would still have a say in you know, how and when those are issued to the establishments. Councilor Donato. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I, I think um, Councilor Feldner's point uh, is an important one, so I, I would just uh, reiterate it. I thought um, the way it was presented to us and um, as an attachment to the uh, committee minutes um, as a kind of a synopsis of each of the restaurants that have already been signed up and that are going to be taking up um, leases in Arsenal Yards and um, the majority of them are smaller size restaurants. So um, I can understand your concern about adding an additional 15. None of these, um, uh, at least based on the descriptions and, and the restaurants that I'm familiar with, none of them would be, a, you know, a quote unquote bar. They're all restaurants and, you know, seemingly smaller size restaurants. To uh, Councillor Canellis's point, I, I think the, the committee members want to make sure that this process is fair. We understand that it seems like a, a, a large increase in the number of licenses. Um, and I think uh, the, uh, the council back in 2016 and its uh, wisdom then decided that these, uh, the different liquor licenses would have different fees. Uh, and I think that was to help protect the value of the quote unquote uh, traditional uh, liquor license. And again, to Councillor Canellis's point, um, you know, we are, I am concerned about local business. I don't want to see any of the local businesses go out of business. Uh, Arsenal Yards is here, and I think we need to uh, do all that we can to ensure the success of that project. And, um, you know, they've got leases for a lot of restaurants opening up, and I think allowing those uh, restaurants. Uh, the opportunity to pursue a liquor license um, is one that uh, we need to provide them with. So I will be voting in favor of this tonight. Thank you. Councillor Woodland. Just to piggyback off that a little, I, I think it's important to remember that 
when, uh, especially in the Pleasant Street Quarter District, when developments came forward in the 2014 timeframe, a lot of times when folks came out to meetings, they indicated they wanted mixed use, so they wanted some residential and commercial, and a strong desire for the commercial piece was a restaurant or something of that nature. So it was always going to be incumbent upon us um, if we were going to fulfill that desire and that want of the community, um, especially in the Pleasant Street area and this area, was going to be to request more liquor license so that we can uh, fulfill, uh, I mean, a restaurant's not going to, it's going to be very hard for restaurants to survive without one. So if we're going to meet that expectation of the community and the expectations that we set on folks that are coming into town, then we, it is incumbent upon us to get these for them. Okay. Can I get a roll call on this, please? Councilor Palumbo? Yes. Councilor Picciarelli? Yes. Councilor Woodland? Yes. Councilor Bays? Yes. Councilor Donato? Yes. Councilor Falkoff? No. Councilor Feltner? Yes. Councilor Canellis? No. President Sedaris? Yes, thank you. The motion passes. We'll get that off to our state delegation. 11C is the Committees on Public Works and Human Services Report regarding parking and access issues to Filippello Park, in, including the area known as Glen Circle. Councilors Picciarelli, who's the Chair of Public Works, and Councilor Palumba, Chair of Human Services, and I guess Councilor... Okay, okay Picciarelli is going to read the report. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so the Joint Committees uh, met Monday, May 6th. Um, Myself, uh, Chair of Public Works, Council Plumber, Vice Chair of Public Works, Council Woodland Secretary of Public Works, and the Human Services uh, Committee with Council Plumber, Chair of, of Human Services, Council Bays, Vice Chair, and Council Falkoff, Secretary. Um, the purpose of the meeting was to continue to discuss and develop policy guidance regarding parking and access issues surrounding Philippello Park, including the area informally known as Glen Circle. Mr. Magoon started the meeting by presenting the staff's response to the eight questions brought up by the joint committees at the prior me uh, meeting. Mr. Magoon also mentioned that while not the focus of the eight questions, the staff did discuss some additional signage and marking improvements for the area. Number one, these are the eight questions that we had asked. Uh, number one, confirm whether or not Glen Circle has a deed restriction or other obligations that would prevent the, the area from being used for parking. Uh, the staff is continuing to look at this issue. Number two, whether it makes sense to increase the parking duration on the surrounding streets above the one hour limit. Staff noted that this is under the jurisdiction of the Traffic Commission. Additionally, there's no history of why the parking duration is what it is today, but there is no objection to making it the same as other parts of the town. Number three, information about the feasibility of a pilot permit parking program in this area in light of the current parking situation and other relevant regulations. Staff noted that significant staffing implications in setting up, administering, and enforcing such a program. Additionally, there are concerns that similar programs would want to be established throughout the other similar areas of the town. Also, there is a general concern about reserving this area for butters and the potential windfall that would result for those residential properties. There's an open question as to whether or not such an act would be an appropriate disposition of public property. Number four, information about the feasibility of reserving Glen Circle for resident parking only with assigned parking spots. Uh, staff noted these concerns were covered in uh, question three above. Uh, number five, whether we can completely close the gate between Glen Circle and Filippello Park. Staff noted that closing the gate would create concerns for users of the park and limit access, which we want to encourage. For example, there could no longer be drop off and pick up in this area if the gate is permanently closed. Number six, is it possible and does it make sense to reconfigure the street so there's one way traffic through Glen Circle from Berkeley Street to Clarendon Street? Staff noted this would not add significant parking. Whether or not the traffic flow would be benefited was also discussed and would need further research. Number seven, ask the administration for options to provide additional parking for users of Filippello Park that relieves the burden on the Berkeley Street and Clarendon Street neighborhood. Staff noted they are examining options with a goal of additional parking for the park. And number eight, clarify whether the Grove Street parking lot of Filippello Park is available for overnight parking during the winter parking ban. 
The DPW and police noted that this is not on the official list of lots, but is somewhat treated as such. However, there's little use. Staff noted there are some safety implications regarding lighting if the town were to allow parking there at night. The joint committees then discussed the staff recommendations with a series of clarification questions. Councilor Cornelis then spoke regarding the 1983 town council resolution to close the gate that allows access to Philippella Park from Glen Circle. Councilor Cornelis also spoke about the community benefits that would result from reaffirming the resolution among other related issues. Members of the public spoke next. Issues concerned dissatisfaction with the council's response to residential concerns, handicap parking, parking availability in general, safety issues particularly related to speeding, noise from park users congregating in the area, and the neighborhood request for closing the gate between Philippella Park and Glen Circle. A resident provided photos of parking in the area showing many cars parked on Arlington Street while the Grove Street parking lot was empty. Council Palumba and Council Bays said they support closing the gate, providing the other side of uh, providing the other side of Grove Street as overnight parking, and doing a pilot resident parking <coughs> permit program. Council Falkoff mentioned she's inclined to support closing the gate and other general improvements, but not sure if resident parking permit program is needed just yet. Council Woodland noted that we should seek objective evidence to substantiate the safety concerns before making policy decisions. Mr. Santola noted additional lighting was recently added to the Grove Street parking area and other related renovations that are happening in the park. Councilor Canellis spoke commending the petition of residents and against a parking permit program. Councilor Picciarelli closed by noting the general history and process of the issues at hand, including how seriously the town council takes vehicle and pedestrian safety and supported closing the gate for both safety reasons and out of respect for the policy of the town council voted in 1983. Council Palumba made a motion seconded by Council Falkoff to ask the full town council to direct the administration to close the gate that allows access to Philippella Park from Glen Circle. The vote was four to one with Council Woodland voting no. Mr. Mee confirmed that if the gate were to be closed, the sidewalk inside the park to the gate would also be removed. Council Falkoff made a motion seconded by Council Palumba to ask the full town councils to direct the administration to allow winter parking in the Grove Street lot parking lot, but not in the parking spaces along the driveway. The motion passed unanimously. Mr. Mee confirmed that the parking spaces along the driveway could not be used for winter parking because they would interfere with the operation of the snow dump and that signs would be installed advising where winter parking would be allowed. Councilor Falkoff made a motion seconded by Council Palumba to ask the full town council for a referral to the Committee on Public Works to address signage, striping, lighting, stormwater, and landscaping at the Glen Circle parking area. The motion passed unanimously. Mr. Mee confirmed the design for upgrading the Glen Circle parking area would be handled within the capital improvement program and not the DPW operating budget. Council Falkoff made a motion seconded by Council Palumba to ask the full-time council to ask the Traffic Commission to look at the possibility of adding a drop-off and pick-up location on Arlington Street for Philippella Park. The vote was four to one with Council Woodland voting no. The Joint Committee decided not to take action on any of the remaining items. The meeting adjourned at 9.15 and the report was prepared by uh, Council Woodland. So thank you for doing that so promptly. Can I get a motion to accept the report? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Any discussion? Councilor Falcoff. Yeah, um, in the last of the motions, um, we had talked about changing the word possibility to advisability, and it might seem like a small point, but I think there wasn't consensus that it was a good idea, but we wanted to raise the issue with the traffic commission, and advisability seemed like a uh, better word for that reason. So I would like to propose that we amend it with that word change. Is, it, is, is there a second? Second. Any discussion on that amendment? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? You guys have it. Continued discussion on the report itself? Councilor Donato? I just I had two questions, and I apologize because I was not able to meet, uh, make this for the earlier meeting. Um, the question six that was posed to staff about reconfiguring uh, the street to one-way traffic, the answer uh, seems to be related to parking, but it was my under or my impression after the first committee report that 
making it one way had something to do with the, the flow of traffic and to prevent people from speeding through that area. Am I mistaken? There was quite, uh, excuse me, Mr. Um, there was quite, there was quite a bit of discussion about that and uh, mm, it was decided uh, after much discussion that it really didn't make sense. So the committee decided to just drop it. And if I could ask one more question, um, I, I guess I'm just a little concerned. Uh, I understand the neighbors want to close off the gate and it seems to be that there's, there's some support for that. I guess the only question I had was if we open up the Grove Street parking lot to overnight parking during the winter and that gate is closed off, is that going to make it more difficult for those residents to reach the Grove Street parking area? I don't know if that was addressed at the meeting, but that was a concern that I had. Uh, through you, Mr. President. Yes, uh, that actually was. There are, are there is a parking lot uh, that goes right up to Arlington Street, right around the corner, and uh, nobody seemed to think it was an issue to to just walk up and around. I have to I can comment on that. Okay. Thank Bays. you, Mr. President. Councilor Bays. Um, the residents were fine with walking around. They the, they have to walk much further right now because they're they're parking way far away. So. Councilor Falcoff. And Mr. Santola um, informed the committees that lighting had been improved, and he felt that it was now really adequate for that purpose. Thank you. Councilor Feltner. Hi. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to clarification. Um, just on the wording, it said that, oh shoot, about, I can't remember where it is on here, but uh, that we wanted to activate that and the closing wouldn't activate it, the, the way the wording was, or, or is it opposite? Um, I think in number, uh, yeah, number five, whether we can completely close the gate, staff noted Gate closing would create concerns for users of the park and limit access, which we want to encourage. So, we want to encourage access, or are we wanting to limit access? The well, the committee the voted to limit the access by closing the gate. I think the it, it, recommendation is to close the gate, which limits the access. Dis but In other words, uh, yeah. So. You want to discourage, not encourage. No, the, the staff. Access. The staff was advocating. It appears from the report to encourage and keep the gate open. Yes. The committee chose not to go in that road, that direction. Okay, I was trying to. The, com the committee went against the recommendation of the staff. Okay. Did I get that? Yes. I yes. Bet. Okay. It was robust, Co robust discussion. Councilor Connells, again, on the report, please. This is just right. Thank yeah. you. On, on the report, following up on item number five, um, the discussion was from the staff that um, they would want to encourage access to the park. And that was the same scenario that was brought forward in 1999 when the access point was opened. There is no physical gate. It's just an access point. Okay. When the town council resolution was written in 1983, it was written that the access point would not exist because it would be detrimental to the neighborhood. Then in 1999, which was the redevelopment and improvement Council of the Council, on park. the report, please. Yeah, thank That's you. That's not on the report. Okay. Item number five. Okay. Encourage or discourage. Okay. Thank you. Anybody, anyone else on the report itself? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The action items. Number one, I need a motion. So, Mr. President, I make a motion that the town council directs the administration to close the gate that allows access to Philippello Park from Glen Circle. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. Councilor Woodland. So, I'm always perplexed um, when we have these not seemingly large issues. Almost everything we did tonight, I think, is significantly uh, more important uh, than the vote than this vote that we'll take right now um, but this theme keeps coming up and it's the theme that irks me more than this particular issue but on the issue itself we have a municipal parking area that's next to a park and a field 
and the proposal tonight is to shut that. So if you were gonna go park in the municipal lot that's next to the park, you wouldn't be able to access it unless you scale the fence. So that's the vote tonight, and I think it's really important for me to put that in uh, very clear terms for the public, because I think when you put it in those terms, it sounds ridiculous that we're looking to close it. I think uh, more along the lines of what I want to talk about was just that the committees keep getting in this idea of doing what's easy as opposed to doing what's right. I do not believe that this is being proposed tonight for any other reason that, any justified reason, except the folks in the area don't want people driving down that road to park in that area. And that's not a good enough reason to close this gate and have an impact on this park. Um, there were folks brought up safety issues of people racing down streets, which were not substantiated. Um, I used to play softball there, and I've driven down that street a million times. Um, you know, played in that park my whole life. Uh, I've never seen anything to that effect. Um, but because there were a lot of folks in the room that advocated that position, and no one in the room said contrary, it was easy for people on the committee to say, you know what, we're just gonna do that. Um, we keep coming to the situation where we make these easy decisions over the decisions that are right. And this isn't the first time we've done it, but it's a constant theme that keeps happening. Uh, the right thing to do would be to hold this gate open so that people can go from the municipal parking lot to the municipal park. Uh, it seems very straightforward to me. If someone had asked me six months ago if the council would ever consider something like this, I probably would have laughed. Um, so that's why I took my vote the way I did. We don't have any substantiated evidence that this is a detriment. Um, a lot of folks came out and, and said to that effect. Um, without, we, I mean, the committee didn't look at it. The committee didn't say, hey, uh, you know, police department, can you talk about your experience in the area? Um, you know, DPW, how this will affect your operations? Um, you know, Mr. Santola, what do you think the park users are gonna be, uh, their response is gonna be to this? None of those considerations. So the folks in the room said this is our easy fix, and the committee said yes, because that will take the easier route. And so, uh, I, I mean, this, it's, it's four, four to one on the committee level. I don't think this spiel is gonna go anywhere. I have no illusions that this is gonna be uh, voted against this evening, but I mean, I guess I just want the public to know that that's the most basic terms. I think it's ridiculous, but I'm even more concerned about the precedent that it sets moving forward. Thank you. Any other comments? Councilor Cornelis? Thank you. As many of you know, I've been advocating for this for a long time. Not advocating because I'm a resident of Berkeley or Clarendon Street. Advocating for it because my constituents are there. These are the people, these are the taxpayers of Watertown who reside there. This parking area existed prior to Filipello Park. We cannot forget that. It's part of the material that it's been handed out and rehanded out to the sitting town council and previous town councils. The parking area was pre-existing. It's Berkeley and Clarendon Streets are a very unique neighborhood. I think if a property opened up, maybe some of my colleagues would like to reside there and be part of the park neighborhood. It's a lovely neighborhood, wonderful residents of Watertown, and I would have no problem residing there myself. Many of my friends who I went to school there resided there. I don't think we're setting precedent. I've seen this council chamber packed with people lobbying for a specific interest, not necessarily a neighborhood interest, possibly other interests that they've lobbied for. And yes, the sitting town council possibly will cave because they don't want to be part of the no vote. Well, many times I am. I do have a backbone to do that. I hope that my colleagues support the residents of Clarendon and Berkeley Street and also support the town council of 1983 who wrote the resolution indicating that the access point should remain closed because there would be an infringement on the neighborhood and two of the then town sitting, sitting town councilors were East Enders, 
Mr. Louis Andrews, and Mr. John Diliberto, and they knew exactly what it was like to be an East Ender. They had relatives, they had friends in the Berkeley Clarendon Street area. They knew what it was all about, and that's why the resolution was written. It would be detrimental to the neighborhood to have access to the park. And I've stated this repeatedly. I brought it forward. The administration knew about the 1983 res resolution. Many other people didn't, including myself. That resolution came to me after the fact. I was not aware of it in 1999 when the access point was opened. The 83 resolution was part of the Filipello Park package of material in the planning office. I think it was disrespectful to the town council of 1983 and disrespectful to the residents that it was allowed to happen. So I hope that my colleagues will see the information before them, understand the plight of the residents in the area, and act accordingly. Thank you. Councilor Feltner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, d I don't know if um, Mr. Santola wants to speak to this, but I just want to be clear that I know what I think I'm talking about. The access point is you would go in Berkeley or Clarendon, and there's that parking in the back. And my memory from Hosmer school days is that you'd, there's the shelter there with the water and the bathrooms and the grills. So if people don't access in there, because we always had like our end of year parties, how do, how do people get to that? Can you drive, can you remind me if you can drive up and drop people off there? Councilor Picciarelli. Um, there's plenty of attachments that were as part of the package, but you could, uh, you could drop, well, you could certainly drop people off in the Grove Street parking lot and walk up the walkway to the, that area. Um, you could park along uh, um, Arlington Street, and there is sort of a, a large area along Arlington Street that's posted as no parking that people use as a informal drop-off and pick-up location, which was sort of the fourth uh, recommendation that uh, we had there. Um, I, if I could, Ms. President, just uh, yeah. just to, to fo follow up on that. Th this committee, we spent a lot of time looking at this. We looked at a lot of things, and, and these four recommendations are all sort of intend to work together as a as a suite of solutions to to solve the, the problems around the area. Uh, not any one of them in its own is is, is the silver bullet that's going to solve the problem, or is just the easy decision. Uh, to make, but but we actually looked at all four of them. So so all four of the recommendations, I think, on, are important to be considered as a complete package, even though we're voting on them separately, uh, to sort of solve the problem once and for all uh, in this area, and, and hopefully uh, restore some harmony to both the residents who live in the area and, and the users of the park. So that's um, my view of that. So follow up. as a follow-up, I guess I just, it, it's hard to get a sense of what staff thinks in voting on this, given that there's going to be further research about um, adding other parking and how that might affect the ability to, whether it's small children or safety issues or burden on the neighbors um, or, uh, you know, ADA access, et cetera. Um, so it's difficult for me, one, knowing that the staff would rather have the gate be open to vote on it closed, but also we've asked, the action item is asking for more information or alternatives that we're not sure what they're going to discover yet. The, so I'll just put that out there. This is the action item that's in front of the council this evening. Right. You're entitled to vote no if you don't I'm agree with it. You, know that you can you can let you, but. This is the action items that the committee came up with. Okay. We can't change that. Okay. Councilor Bays. Um, so, uh, Councilor Woodland is right. In a perfect world, we could study this and, and come up with a solution based on the study. But if we studied every single gate that needed to be closed, <laughs> we, we probably couldn't have made the vote that we did earlier tonight. 
we, we don't have a perfect world where we can study every single decision we make. So all we had to go on was what the residents were telling us was happening in that area. And they were telling us that it was unsafe, that they felt it was unsafe. And, and people were being picked up and dropped off and other cars were whizzing around him as little kids were getting in and out of cars. It, it did not feel like a safe situation. And, and that's what we had to go on. So that's why we made that decision. Are there any other comments? I'm gonna wrap this up or I'm gonna put this at another meeting because we're getting late. Councilor uh, Canellis. Uh, just to uh, reference the access. Six of you were on the committee. Just to access the grills that was referenced earlier by Councillor um, Feltner, the grills are accessed from the Grove Street parking lot. Councillor Woodland. Just to follow up on the doing a study piece, the example I gave during the committee meeting was a, a safety speeding study that I did on Acton Street in between Jensen and Mosedale. And what the residents there said was people were speeding. I asked the police to go down and do a study. They went down and did one. They found that statistically the speeding was not happening. They did a study over a several week period. They came back with these standards and conclusions that are based on um, the national ways that they look at these figures, um, adjusting for speed. Long story short, we didn't move forward with putting up a speed bump or other mitigation because there was no statistical evidence or objective evidence to support that. And so we do not have that in this situation. So it is possible to get, and we have gotten it in the past, and that used to help us uh, be informed about our decision making. Councilor Palumba. Councilor Donato. Thank you, Mr. President. I can understand Councilor Woodner, uh, <laughs> Woodland's concern about uh, closing off access to a municipal park from a, a municipal parking lot. Um, I think what I would say is if we do close access, it's not going to prohibit any other residents from parking there. Um, you know, it might make their walk into the park a little longer, but I think if that's a good balancing act if it gives the, the neighborhood a little bit of a relief and it just, you know, yes, it might be an inconvenience, but in the grand scheme of things, I, I, it seems to me as though it would be a slight inconvenience to walk around to Arlington Street. So I'm going to vote in favor of closing access. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed. Pre I was Can I get a roll call, please? Councilor Picciarelli? Yes. Councilor Woodland? No. Councilor Bays? Yes. Councilor Donato? Yes. Councilor Falkoff? Yes. Councilor Feltner? Present. Councilor Canellas? Yes. Councilor Palumba? Yes. President Steris? Yes. Action item number two, please. Um, Mr. President, I make a motion that the Town Council directs the administration to allow winter parking in the Grove Street parking lot but not in the spaces along the driveway. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Number three. Mr. President, I make a motion uh, that the town council makes a referral to the Committee on Public Works to address signage, striping, lighting, stormwater, and landscaping at the Glen Circle parking area. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Item number four. Uh, Mr. President, I ask that the town council ask the traffic commission to look at the advisability of adding a drop-off and pickup location on Arlington Street for Philippella Park. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Councilor Woodland. The reason I voted no to this was because one of the reasons the committee indicated they wanted to close the gate was because they didn't want to pick up, pick up and drop off location at Glen Circle because of safety issues. But now we're asking to consider a pickup drop off on Arlington Street, which is what, 100 times busier. So just the, 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 the ridiculousness of that is why I voted no and why I'll be opposing this tonight. It, it couldn't be any more contradictory to the central theme of the last argument. Councilor Canellis. Thank you. Um, I did not have a vote on this, certainly at the committee level, but um, it's up to the Traffic Commission to review. Um, I do not have the expertise, but I don't think that um, it would be appropriate on Arlington Street. It's a, it's a very busy roadway. The Grove Street parking lot, I think, is the most appropriate. Young people are there to play sports. 
so they can walk from the Grove Street parking lot across the fields. It's exercise, it's sport. Thank you. Any other comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. One opposed. Thank you. Let me just say that there were several other committee reports that didn't make this agenda because there were really no action items. We will be placing them on a future agenda. As you can see, we're trying to manage our time a little bit. New business. Any new business to come before the council? We're not allowed to do new business. Pardon me? We're not allowed to. You can, you can say that you're going to bring something <laughs> up next week. Well, I'm not. Okay. Communications from the town manager, and first thing is a request for confirmation of appointment and reappointment to the Watertown Housing Authority. Mr. Manager. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, members of the council. Again, uh, bringing forward tonight a request for appointment and reappointment to the Watertown Housing Authority, which requires council confirmation. The appointment would be as follows. Uh, uh, Patricia Santos, who will be the tenant representative uh, at 100 Warren Street, apartment 301. Her term would go to May 15, 2023. And the reappointment would be uh, Shannon Lawn at 20 Pilgrim Road, and her term would go to May 15, 2024. Under the council rules, uh, both the appointment and reappointment are referred to the Committee on Human Services for their review and report back to the full town council. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Anything else? Uh, just two items. One is a week from today starts the uh, modified uh, Hours of Operation Administration building. It will be open uh, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday will be the, the 8.30 to 5, but on Tuesdays it will be 8.30 to 7 p.m., and then Fridays would be 8.30 to 2 p.m., and that schedule will be in effect till Friday, August uh, 30th. And additionally, uh, two notes on the Memorial Day that the uh, administration will be closed Observance Memorial Day, and then more importantly, the town's annual Memorial Day parade will be held on Monday, May 27, starting at noon at the Grove Street East End, and uh, certainly uh, looking forward to everyone attending. Mr. President. Thank you. Request for information. Any requests for information? Seeing none, announcements. Any announcements? Public forum. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you.